Welcome to my series on the 1959 Deluxe Tweed. I had a friend that texted me. He says, hey, I'm buying a Fender Deluxe Tweed. Would you be interested in looking at it? Yes, please bring it by. Oh, wow, a Fender Deluxe Tweed. This would be cool. So this video is going to, series is going to be very different. Uh, based on what I learned out of the Premier Twin 8, I'm going to do this video series about... The, the Fender Deluxe Tweed, I'm going to go into details about it in its original condition. So this is going to be the overview video and there will be many more videos that I'll put into a playlist for you eventually uh, that goes into all the details about this Fender Deluxe Tweed. It's rare to find an amp with one owner. It had one owner and this fellow, uh, my friend, bought it from that owner. And it has all the original parts. I'm going to go into that in other videos. It's still working. Well, okay, two out of three uh, are right. It may or may not be still working. We'll have, I'm going to have to get into that. But it was working at the time the previous owner quit playing it. So the idea is, would love to play it. Can you look at it? Make sure that we don't fry anything when I plug it into the wall. We're going to get a peek at history through this amp. Always do. Document as much as possible for others that have a Fender Deluxe Tweed and want to compare notes. I have a photo survey of just about everything. So maybe you're wanting to uh, compare notes. Maybe you're new to the hobby and just curious about the amp. I took a lot of measurements. Uh, frequency response data, impedance curve data, dimensions, voltages collected and updated, actually building exact replica, including dimensions of the cabinet and the chassis in case you want to build your own. Again, an extensive photo survey, several videos, I'm going to publish as much as possible. So there may be some repeat information between one video and the next. Because as you get different perspectives on the same subject, sometimes you come back with a discovery go, I, the first time I didn't see it, but the second time I did see it, what gives? What's that? You can dive into it a little bit more. So I preserve amps. I don't modify them. I just get them up and running, check them out, get them up and running, hand them back. I don't modify. I don't uh, replace parts. I don't upgrade. Uh, the replacement parts must meet the original design specifications. I'm not going to just pull a power transformer and put a new one in. I'm going to pull it, I'm going to measure it, and that way I have the specs and I can then order one wound to that spec. Especially with the output transformer, I have several videos on that. You just can't go pull one off the shelf, stick it in there, because the amp's going to sound different than the original. So I'm really interested and how it was built, what did they use, what were the exact specifications, and then what does that sound like? If I had went back to 1959 and plugged it in the wall and started playing it, is that the sound that they heard? That's very important to me. I make one exception to all these rules, and that is I will make sure that amp is safe to operate according to National Electric Code and that means I will put in a chassis ground. I do want, it's 63 years old. If while you're playing the power transformer develops a short, there's going to be several hundred volts go through the amp through you to ground. If the output transformer finally breaks down and shorts, there's going to be hundreds of volts through the amp through you to ground. I will not play it otherwise and I don't want you to. I want to make sure it's safe. What you do after that is your business. Whether you choose to operate the amp or not, that's your business, your safety concern. But as far as I'm concerned in my shop, when I'm playing with it, I'm installing a chassis ground. So, with all the rules said, that's the exception I make. In the marketing brochure, there's no mention of wattage. It says here's a pair of 6V6s. Standard knowledge back then by people who bought these amps was, okay, it's a 15 watt amp, so I need to know. A pair of 6V6s, 15 amps, I'm good. Back then, though, it, not only did Fender do this, but other manufacturers did too. It has five tubes. It runs as though it's seven, a seven tube amp because the two preamps each do two things a piece. So five plus two is seven. 
That's equivalent to saying uh, it's a transistor radio or this transistor radio now has 10 transistors. The computer chip has hundreds of transistors equivalent, thousands equivalent. Now there's millions and millions of transistors equivalent in the CPU. It means really nothing. Other than it's a marketing point. Okay, great. This is a 7-tube equivalent amp. Back then, what did it cost? Well, in 1959, it was $129.50 and it shipping weight was 28 pounds. In 1960, it went up a few dollars and now it weighs 29 pounds. The amp probably doesn't weigh 29 pounds, but the packing material was another pound. So, 129 bucks. Back then, the 12-inch speaker was 25 bucks. In 1960, it was 30, uh, 27 dollars right there. But look, the difference between 1959 and 1960. In 59 is a 12-inch speaker. It's a Jensen. Okay, it's not a Utah, it's not Omaha. It's, it's a Jensen. I want a Jensen. It's a sell point. But then, once it, was, it hit the market, uh, they realized a bigger selling point would be it's a 12-inch Jensen P12R or a 12-inch Jensen P12Q. The uh, musicians were discerning differences in speakers and they had uh, different wants and needs. So they would market to that. So there was a marketing change between 1959 and 1960 for fender replacement parts. Today, if you were to buy that speaker, it is at least 126 bucks. It is as much as the ant cost in 1959. A lot of things have changed. The plate, the name plate is chromed. And because it's chromed, you can't, the only thing you can do to get a background is a silk screen on the brown background. So it's a chrome plate, brown silk screen background. That's how they did it. Uh, fr a front in the back of the uh, amp, left and right. It has been in contact with water, it is wicked up a bit. You can see the moisture lines. Inside the amp is clean, but the outside the tweeds got a little bit of an issue. Look at the tweed pattern. It comes up. Let's see if I can do this right. Yeah. Tweed comes up and down. So it makes a herringbone pattern on the top. And here's the reverse herringbone. I point that out because it, it takes uh, a bit of craftsmanship to do that, to get it all matched up. Now, this is also a narrow panel design. Amps back then, or even today, they run the whole width of the amp front, or the whole width of the amp on top. This is a narrow panel design because it doesn't run the whole width. Here's the uh, pattern on the tweed on the, in the corners. All the corners are this way. Someone took the time and effort to, uh, sorry, to line up the the pattern time and effort and craftsmanship this is one of the last it, it makes this a desirable item because it's tweed and also about the tweed that the patterns match the herringbone and then and on the top and then this on the on the corners so someone has spent a lot of time and effort to do that but it's it's costly and, and time consuming so manufacturers went to black tolex then it making a difference how it's put on, it's black, it's Tolex, it's the same pattern, we can move more product. Don't spend any time here. It speaks volumes about the worker back then. Time and effort, get it right, it bothers them, it won't sell, so they're going to make it look right. This is just spectacular. Ground switch, another video is going to talk about that. All the uh, print on here is silk screened on. Look at the fuse. It's the tapered uh, top, indicative of the era back then. They Afterwards, they started squaring up a bit. The dog bone switch uh, for the ground switch. It's not really a ground switch. We'll cover that later. Dog bone pilot light. Let me go back. On the top here, all the print is silk screened on as well. If you run your fingers across the top, you can feel the raised lettering. It's silk screened on. Back of the amp, all the original compounds. 
you can tell it has contacted water. You can see it must have come in on the feet a little bit and just migrated through to Alexa's coming loose in this spot. But it's, it's still a good herringbone. If you were to lay that flat, it's still a herringbone. The, they spent a lot of time and effort on this. The feet are one inch in diameter, three inch thick steel. The handles nine inches long, one inch wide in the middle, three quarters of an inch on the ends, three eighths thick. I do not pick the amp up with leather handles when they're this old. I don't want to actually possibly break it uh, along this line. You can see a crease, or worse yet, you know that'd be worse bad, or split it right on out the end. Uh, I leave those things alone. The owner can decide what to do, but I don't touch the handles. You can buy replacements. There are people that actually build these and sell them uh, out on the internet. So you can get this replaced to a handle that will be more functional, reliable. The grill cloth is probably a polyester fiber. It's stretchy. It's still stretchy. The strands are uh, 13 thousandths of an a inch diameter. Uh, between on the uh, horizontal stripes, uh, 17 sixteenths, 64 uh, spacing. Between the vertical pattern, 7 16 spacing before it repeats. This yellow, I call it spaghetti yellow because when I pull out my spaghetti package and dump it in the, the water, it's spaghetti yellow. It's what it looks like. So I, I just call it spaghetti yellow. The brown's a nice medium brown, kind of like a milk chocolate brown. And the red, uh, right now it's aged and oxidized. All this probably has. But the red, when you, you zoom in on a few places like right here, you get an indication and a highlight that it must have been more red. Uh, more, not quite a crimson red, but redder, a bright red. Right now it's just a really uh, muted red, almost bl uh, blends in with the milk chocolate brown. But it's red, and that thread uh, repeats uh, throughout the fabric. Like I said, it's stretchy. It feels like a polyester. Um, probably something you would uh, cover all, a, a lawn chair with. The uh, joints on the cabinet, they're not mitered. They're box joints. They're not, for, as a word worker, this kind of bothers me. But it, on the other hand, uh, it's strong. So even though you, you want your box joints to be right in against each other and tight and a little bit of glue they'll hold forever well the nice thing about a box joint box joint is that even if you get a little bit of glue and they're not all the way up in there and they're slightly back this thing's rock solid it is not giving it up so when you cut a box joint putting those joints together it's not like they, they lay in there it takes some effort to get them pressed into place it's tight all of its own. Sometimes after you make a box joint, you test it out. Um, getting it apart is a bit of a trick. You go, uh, if I glued this, I'm going to break it. If I didn't glue it, it's going to take some time, effort to get it to pull apart again because they're tight. This thing's tight. It has been glued. They're not perfect, but it's tight. And that, box, that cabinet is rock solid. Unlike... <clears throat> Uh, the cabinet for a Premier Twin 8. <laughs> Finding one that's intact is kind of sometimes a challenge. They're typically got issues and they're a little, a little loose, but this one's tight. A nice thing, again, it speaks volumes for Fender and the people that made these and put them together. Uh, they missed the, getting the joint in there, but it's tight. He wanted it to last, obviously. Power cord, uh, SJT cord. It's not SVT. What's that mean? Well, an SVT is for vacuum cleaners. It's a lighter duty uh, jacket. Uh, SJT is a heavier duty jacket uh, cord. It's at 12.8. You'll notice here it says, oh, sorry, uh, 18.2. Uh, that means there's no ground. There's no ground. Both the blades are the same size. There's no such thing as polarized plug back then. No matter which way you plug it in, one's going to be neutral, the other one's going to be hot, vice versa. 
years before, not too many years before, some of the antique radios for AM listening actually had a hot chassis. Well, in guitar amps, a hot chassis would be a bad thing. So rather than, so there's a change in technology. Hot chassis was determined not to be a cool thing, especially for a guitar player, but they don't have a ground cord on here either. That was an advent. It actually didn't get institutionalized until the 70s. And then, not everywhere. It's a slow adoption process. I'll address that in another video. So it's a little heavier duty cord. Again, look at this. Pacific Electric Cord Company. Electric Cord is a company. Well, Pacific Electric Cord is. Here's their logo on the plug in. You can see the logo here on each of the blades. And it says UL listed. Just because it's UL listed back then doesn't mean it's the UL listed now. In fact, if UL got a hold of this amp, they would condemn it. It is unsafe to operate by code. Again, because there's no ground. Uh, the back side, a little, uh, uh, sort of a, a closer view of what's inside. I'm going to talk about this at length in other videos. The uh, craftsmanship and the over-engineering, I guess you would call it. This thing's engineered a lot. I will, I, I kid people, but I think the, um, I believe the grounds even have grounds. So they, each of these tubes are grounded twice. <laughs> it's a well-grounded amp. There's no uh, star ground. It's, they're all, everything's locally grounded and it's grounded twice. So in the next video, I'm going to address asbestos. Oh yeah, there's asbestos in this amp. I'm going to talk about that in the next video. Thank you for watching.